please join me in giving him a warm RIT welcome, Mr. Joshua Bennett. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate it, man. Hey, everybody. This is actually thousands of people. That's pretty awesome. OK. Uh, my name is Joshua Bennett. Um, and I'm just going to read some poems, like I said I was going to do um, this morning. First of all, how's everybody doing? Is everyone well? Good. Everybody's like, yeah, we're about to hear Cornell West. So can you turn me down a little bit, actually? Um, so, yeah, I'm totally ecstatic to be here. I am honored and humbled um, by the warm reception I've received um, from everyone here. And uh, it is an absolute honor, uh, one, to be after Garth Vagan. First of all, those folks were dancing like they had powers. Did anybody else think that was just <laughs> absolutely amazing? <laughs> yeah. And um, Dr. West, and he doesn't know this, but he actually inspired me to want to become a professor when I was 17 years old. Um, I read his book, Race Matters, every day on the way to school. Um, so thank you. And uh, yeah, so we'll jump right into it now. Had my comb in my pocket. That wasn't professional. OK. <laughs> Has everyone here heard spoken word poetry before? OK, so you know what to do. When you like something, you make noise, throw objects. Everybody knows that, that deal. OK, so this first poem is called uh, 10 Things I Want to Say to a Black Woman. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy. Thank you. I didn't even say anything yet. You guys are great. <laughs> They're like, yeah. I love that tire, brother. OK. All right. 10 Things I Want to Say to a Black Woman. One, I wish I could put your voice in a jar. Wait for those lonely winter nights when I forget what God sounds like. Run to the nearest maximum security prison and open it. Watch the notes bounce off the walls like ricochet bullets, etching keyholes into the sternums of every brother in the room. Skeletons opening, rose blossom beautiful to remind you that the way to a black man's heart is not through his stomach. It is through the heaven in your hello. The echo of unborn galaxies that pounces forth from your vocal cords and melts ice grills into oceans, baptizing our lips until harsh words fade from our memories and we forget why we stopped calling you divine in the first place, too. When I was born, my mother's smile was so bright, it knocked the air from my lungs, and I haven't been able to breathe right since. It's something about the way light dances off of your teeth, the way the moon gets jealous when you mock her crescent figure with the shape of your mouth, queen. You make the sky insecure, self-conscious from being forced to stare at your face every morning and realize that the blues of her skin was painted by that symphony doing cartwheels on your tongue. Three, who else can make kings out of bastards? Turn a fatherless Christmas into a floor full of gifts in a kitchen that smells like the Lord is coming tomorrow and we must eat well tonight. I used to think my sister was a blacksmith, the way she bent fire and metal and made kitchen miracles at 14, making a food to feed a little boy who didn't have the words to say how much he meant to him back then or enough backbone to say he was the day he turned 24. Your skin reminds me of everything beautiful I have ever known. The color of ink on a page, the earth we walk on, and the cross that hung my savior. Five, I have seen you crucified too. Spread out on billboards to be spiritually impaled by millions of men with eyes like nails who made martyrs of your daughters. So I'm sorry for the music videos for Justin Timberlake at the Super Bowl and the young man on the corner this morning who made you want to shed your flesh and become invisible. Never doubt that he only insults you because men are confused. And we're trained. And we're trained to destroy or conquer everything we see from birth. Six, if I ever see Don Imus in public, I'll punch him in the face. One time. For every member of the Rutgers and Tennessee women's basketball teams, then I'll show them a picture of Felicia Rashad, Asada Shakur, Eartha Kitt, my mother, my grandmother, and my seven-year-old niece, who's got eyes like firebombs, and then dare him to tell me that black women are only beautiful in one shade of skin. Seven, you are like a sunrise in a nation at war. You remind people that there is always something worth waking up to. Eight, when we are married, I will cook. Do the dishes and wherever else it takes to let you know 
that traditional gender norms have no place in the home we build. So my last name is an option. Babysitting the kids, a treat we split equally in our bed, will be an ancient temple where I construct sculptures of wax on the small of your back. And we make love like the sky is falling, moving to the rhythm of bed springs and bell bib devoe angels applauding in unison, <laughs> saying this is the way it was meant to be not. My daughter will know her father's face from the day she is born. And I can only pray that this Superman complex lasts long enough for me to deflect the pain this world will aim at her from the moment she's old enough to realize that the color brown is still not considered human most places. But my daughter will have a smile like a wheelchair. And so even when I am at my worst, when the kryptonite of this putrid planet threatens to render me grounded, the light dancing off of her teeth will transform the shards of my broken body into heart-shaped blackbirds taking flight on wind that reminds me of my savior's hands. My daughter's smile of my mother's laugh when I was in her womb, 10. Never stop pushing. This world needs you now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I can't stand up that early. Now I'm all, now I'm all nervous. I got to follow that up. I might just do it again. Um, Okay, cool. So let's get right to it. Um, so the second piece um, is actually for, well, it's not for Alvin. I love you. You're great. Um, but I remember you said you wanted some lines for your wife um, and for your son, Juice, you know, to prep him, you know, for later in life. Um, if he grows up to be nerdy and wonderful and needs, you know, creative punchlines, you know, for the ladies. Um, so <laughs> this next piece, um, I wrote it during my year abroad in England where I was studying for theater. And uh, this is just something that really weird poets like myself do. So one day I was just up really late, um, and I thought to myself, what if I was an old man writing a love letter to my wife using an extended metaphor of a blue whale? You know, it just sort of <laughs> came to me. In the throes of the night, it came to me. Um, and this came to me also from, uh, this is why you should pay attention in science class when you're in college. Um, so I was in an oceanography lecture once, and I distinctly remember my professor saying that a blue whale has a heart the size of a car. Um, now, granted, I had no idea what kind of car, you know, because a Humvee and a Prius, it's not the same thing. <laughs> but the image stuck with me, and uh, this poem came out of it. It's called Baleanoptera, and that is the genus name of the blue whale. Okay. <laughs> you dub, shout out. Ah, I love New York people. We're so vibrant, aren't we? <laughs> like everywhere. Brooklyn, is Brooklyn in the house? Just to check. Okay. Everywhere I go, you could be in Tokyo. Brooklyn in the house, yeah, you know. Um, okay, to the poem. Baleanoptera. When we are old, hair the color of tombstones, bones that sound like wet windshield wipers whenever we slow dance through the living room, I imagine that I will look you in the eye as if there is something small and precious in prison there and say to you, darling, did you know that a blue whale has a heart the size of a car? When you reply correctly, as you always seem to do when I ask you difficult questions about oceanography, I'll probably just laugh, rejoicing, over the fact that every time you smile, it makes the wrinkles at the corner of your eyes look like six willow branches, all lifting their heads from prayer in unison, the wind humming a somber hymn beneath its breath, just as our anthem jogs to a close, and I whisper in your ear, how did you know that I was the one? When all of those well-dressed jackals came galloping to your door, begging for the rights to your ring finger, what made you lock the deadbolt on your ribs, looking them squarely in the face, and saying with joy, I am saving all of this beauty for a man I have never even met? Did you ever doubt, ever sit in your dorm room and think that maybe your soulmate had chosen someone a lot more boring, but a lot less picky than you, and opted for the easy way out of a life filled with love? When I was 22 years old, beard freshly grown, an ocean away from my family with the kind of pain that drives men to do selfish, barely forgivable things. I dreamt of you nightly, hunted for your smile and every audience that I broke for, hoping that I could literally steal a glance, download it onto my retinas, and replay the moment our eyes first played freeze tag. And neither one of us wanted to stop being it, so we just kept on touching, hoping that Father Time would give us a hall pass and allow us to orbit one another forever. And speaking of orbits, did you know that there are more stars in the sky than grains of sand on the entire planet, and that would give you 
either one if you merely asked. Peel the night from the sky, skin like the rind of an orange. Or ask God if I could borrow the breeze for just a moment and blow the shoreline of every beach into a giant hourglass made just for us and say this is how long I will adore the things about you that no one else even notices. Like your laugh and how it sounds like a mix of Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock and two rainstorms singing perfectly in tune those orthopedic shoes and how they always match your cardigans perfectly. <laughs> Those crooked glasses and how they dangle at the edge of your nose like the legs of two lovers on a tire swing. The last summer they will ever see each other's face. The first time I saw your face, I thought, wow, if there were a gorgeous Olympics, you would be a lock. And maybe I would be your key. And maybe love is a club that we both got into for free. And we just haven't stopped dancing for all these decades because we really like the music in here. And maybe, if you asked me to, I'd crawl through the veins of a blue whale on my hands and knees, photograph like I've got a handful of diamonds in my throat, and say, see, I told you, the biggest heartbeat God ever made. And now it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, all right, so. I just have two more for y'all. Um, and I guess this next piece is probably the most closely wedded um, to this idea of King's legacy, right? Um, when I think about King's legacy, what, actually first, can I just say how amazing it is to be around this many people, just generally, and as people of color, like I'm at Princeton, I don't see black folks that often. This is awesome. <laughs> Thank you. You have made my week. I feel amazing. I feel awesome right now. I might dance, I might have to hit up Garth Fagan, try to get a tryout, I'm so excited. I'm like, whew, modern dance out here, brother. Um, but this, uh, this next piece, I guess, is tied to dancing, sort of. Um, it is tied to the tradition I grew up in, which was a, a feminist, a black feminist church tradition. I was raised by women, um, you know, by my, my older sister, Latoya, by my mother, um, by Tamara, you know, I was, I was raised in a family of women that were strong, that loved me, and uh, had a dedication to me that is what I think the legacy of King really is, right? What is King's legacy if not an outpouring of love that always orients us towards justice and freedom, right? Um, and so, thank you. Uh, you know, my father, uh, first black man to graduate from his high school in Birmingham, Alabama, he integrated it. Um, and then my mother, you know, growing up poor in the South Bronx, they both just gave me this uh, incredible perspective about what it even meant to be free. Um, that my, my grandmother, who was a sharecropper, would ever see the day of a black president, right? Would ever see the day where her grandson could stand on stage um, and do a poem that is about her in, in some respects, you know? Um, so this next poem is called Jesus Riding Shotgun, and uh, it is about, in large part, you know, the, the family that raised me to love, um, yeah, and the God that, that held them, um, that held them close in his arms, and I knew even when anyone else abandoned me, you know, that God was there, and that he loved us, and loved us the way we were made, and that we were just fine being who we were. Um, so rock with me, got two more, and I'm gonna let Dr. West just blow this thing open. Um, one time. One time. I was raised by a family of sharecroppers, the descendants of North Carolina slaves who held my infant body as if it were cotton, three mothers, all with skin like carpenters. I learned how to worship from the texture of my sister's hands. Figured that's what Jesus' hands must have felt like like wood and fire and hard work from every day walking through a world that clearly does not love you. Me and God have never been strangers. I've always seen his face in the eyes of the women that made my life worth living every Sunday, looking out over a sea of brown faces, church hats, adorning their heads like nylon halos, the pews, one giant rainbow, our sanctuary floating just inches from heaven, close enough for our savior to look upon us and smile, two stepping in rhythm with his children. We danced as if the floor was made of angel feathers, as if we had trampolines in our shins, as if salvation wasn't just some foreign concept, as if we could touch it, snatch it like lightning bugs from the indigo blanket of the night sky, hundreds of hands stretched outward for a promise we could actually depend on my mother spent the first 18 years of her life in a tenement in the South Bronx five brothers and sisters 
two parents and my great grandmother cramped in a brick box the size of a welfare check. I can't imagine what those winters must have felt like with nothing but secondhand blankets and faith to keep them warm. As Ronald Reagan waged war on the inner city and hip hop was born from the ashes of apartment buildings, children going to bed with their shoes on just in case the buildings begin to burn in their sleep. They say that Jesus had eyes full of fire, hair like wool, and feet of bronze that I'm sure he used to help my mother hopscotch over heroin needles every day on her way to school to be proud in spite of a culture that said that her skin was too dark to be washed clean. I was born into the arms of women who believed in God more than they believed in gravity, who taught me how to fly when this world got a little bit too heavy for my fragile skeleton with no money and a fist full of Bible verses stretched as thin as the cotton sheets that covered beds and killed blacks. My great-grandmother's tears like saltwater hymnals sung into the same soil that held her dead lover's bones. We dream of heaven and imagine angels that looked nothing like the whitewashed religion we had been fed. I serve a God without a color who loves in spite of everything and made me this way, a man forged from the wombs of warriors who always knew what it meant to serve, to be both humble and steadfast who stood as if their backbones were made of gold, smiled when their husbands left them before they expected new. On that Sunday morning car rides, the Baptist church is built more like canyons that their savior was riding shotgun his watchful eyes protecting their firstborn son, teaching him how to be a father that would never leave their side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Don't make me cry again. I cried yesterday. Don't do it. Don't do it. Uh, all right, so this is my, uh, my last piece of the evening or the morning. I'm disoriented from the plane ride. Um, so this piece is the, the piece I had the pleasure of doing for Barack Obama uh, back in May of, of 2009. That does sound like a long time ago, doesn't it? I didn't even have facial hair, and you see where I'm at now, right? Um, <laughs> It was amazing, and uh, that was truly a blessing. Um, and probably my favorite thing about, well, there are a couple of favorite parts. One, Michelle Obama is just super down to earth. I don't know if y'all get that vibe, but she was chilling with my mom, right? Like, that last poem about my, my mom is like very South Bronx. I don't know if everybody in here knows what that means, but my mom was in the White House, like, that's my son, woo! Like, really, <laughs> my mom is very South Bronx, and I love it. I'm I was like, what? that's my mom. That's my mama in here. I had one plus one. I brought my mama every time. That's, I'm married. I'm going to be like, sorry, sweetie. So now I'm playing. I'll bring my wife and stuff. But, you know, um, so to me, that was tremendous, right, uh, that the first lady took my mother aside um, after my performance and really talked to her. And, you know, my mom's like, what do you think about my son? You know, he's good, right? She's like, yeah, I really like this. She's like, yeah, I know. I know. That's, you know. She's like, that's all me. I'm like, that's not all you. You don't write poetry. Like, what are you talking about? Right? Um, but my second favorite thing, besides, you know, the mom-Obama connection, was uh, having a group of students from Gallaudet University um, that were there, that were present. Um, a group of deaf students that told me how much they appreciated um, this poem, which is about my beautiful, gracious, brilliant older sister, Tamara, um, who is here today with me. Um, oh, yeah, sure. Can we give it up, please? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you got to stand up, girl. You got to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, and I think in a, in a way that is completely unexpected, I was telling Alvin earlier, I thought this was going to be a gig, like I thought I was going to show up and do some poems, and it was going to be awesome, you know, get some bananas, was, have a good time, you know. Um, and I think what actually ended up happening at RIT was I got potentially a firm insight into what I want to do for the rest of my life, which is help build connections between the deaf and hearing community um, here in the U.S. I feel like... Thank you. Um, it is such important work that needs to be done. And I sincerely hope if you take nothing else away about whales, like I really want you to take away this idea that I have a, a sort of firm desire in my heart to pour the rest of my life out into these communities that I was born into, into the life that my sister was born into, the culture that she loves. Um, the culture she shares with her boyfriend Benjamin and her daughter Jada, and that she shares with her, her younger brother. Um, so this is Tamara's opus, 
It is a, a poem for my older sister and for everyone here. Um, so thank you just for taking the time to listen. You've been an amazing audience, and uh, I will leave you with, um, with this. Whew. All right. All right. Tamara has never listened to hip-hop, never danced to the rhythm of raindrops or fallen asleep to a chorus of chirping crickets. All she knows is silence. A lonely Long Island apartment as quiet as a premature infant dying before it takes its first breath. She has been deaf for as long as I have been alive. And ever since the day that I first turned five and realized that my sister could not sing happy birthday like all my other friends and family, I wondered why things had to be this way. My father said, Joshua, nothing is wrong with Tamara. God just makes some people different. And at that moment, those nine letters felt like hammers, swung gracefully by unholy hands to shatter my stained glass innocence into shards that can never be pieced back together or do anything more than sever the ties between my sister and I. I waited, was patient numberless years, anticipating the second her ears would open like lotuses and allow my sun-kept sentences to seep into her insides, appeal to her subconscious mind and make her remember all of those conversations we must have had in heaven back when God handpicked us to be sibling souls centuries ago. I still remember her 20th birthday. Readily recall my awestruck 11-year-old eyes as I watched deaf men and women of all ages dance in unison to the vibrations of speakers booming so loud that I imagined angels chastising us for disturbing their worship with such beautiful blasphemy until you have seen a deaf girl dance. You know nothing of passion. These people knew my sister in ways that I never could. Shared a common struggle that outweighed whatever fickle traces of my father's blood actually ran within our veins. There was a barricade between us that I never took the time to destroy. Never for even a moment thought to pick up a book and look up the sign for sister, for family, for goodbye. I will see you again. Someday, remember the face of your little brother. It's only now I see. I was never willing to put in the extra effort to love her properly. So as the only person in my family who is not fluent in sign language, I've decided to take this time to apologize to Mara. I am sorry for my silence. For the blank stare in my eyes when you and dad would make jokes that caused volcanic laughter to erupt from your insides and peel the covering off of the foolish pride that's allowed me to pass you notes for all these years instead of simply coping with the fact that you cannot hear and loving you for the way you were made. True love knows no frequency. And so I will use these hands to speak volumes that can never be contained within the boundaries of sound waves. I will shout at the top of my fingertips until digits dance and relay these mental messages directly to your soul. I know that there is no poem I can make up for all the time we have lost, so please, if you can, just listen. So I play you a symphony on the strings of my heart, made for no other ears on this earth but yours. <laughs>